This week, we're looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to answer this question, who is the kingdom of God for? Welcome to Westside. As a freshman in high school, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. 
The doctor told me that it was just a chemical imbalance in my brain. Um, and in order to balance that out, he gave me antidepressants and medication. I started to lose faith that God was real or existed. Inside, doubted that I would ever be healed, that I would ever be made whole again. I had a moment one night where I stopped and I said, Jesus, you're the only one who's gonna be able to fix this. The medication isn't working. I'm not feeling better. The counselor's not working. You, ha you have to heal me. You have to do something. He stepped in in that moment. There was no big life change, but I felt the presence of God near. After coming off of the medication, I had to learn a new normal. I didn't bounce back. I was not the kid that I was before this all happened, and I had to learn how to function in a new way. I still didn't feel a lot. I still was pretty unemotional, and as I felt things, I thought I was getting healthy, I would recognize an emotion and put it to the side without ever really feeling it or experiencing it or analyzing where it was coming from or why. All of that pushing down caught up with me 12 years later when I had my first anxiety attack. After the first anxiety attack, uh, I continued to feel sick and unsettled and knew physically my body was under attack in some ways because of what was happening emotionally and mentally inside. Through the process of walking through my trauma with a counselor, I found that bringing things into the light brought freedom and it unburdened me in the heavy weight that I had been carrying for so many years. It's been a long road getting from that moment to where I am today. A lot of pain, a lot of struggles, um, and a lot of allowing Jesus to walk with me and asking him to stay inside the journey with me. I've had to learn how I'm wired and how I process things and why I do or don't feel things the same as other people and to know that those aren't bad things, but to learn the goodness inside of them. I think it's important for us to find the people and the spaces in which we find safety and to allow those people to see us and know us. We need to remember that we're not alone, that there's a God who loves us fiercely and wants to walk in freedom with us. Keep your eyes on him and hold on to that glimmer of hope. Jesus first comes onto the scene and before he begins to teach his Sermon on the Mount, he's in the wilderness with John the Baptist and he's talking about this thing called the kingdom of heaven that it's gonna come. And uh, if we look at what Jesus is doing, his entire ministry and his entire mission is to bring about this understanding of what is priority. He's, he's trying to help people understand what is temporal and fading and not worth building our lives upon and the things that really matter. The things that are at the top of the list when your world is shaken. We don't need to see some end of the world apocalypse, bombs exploding and fire coming down to understand that all things are passing away. We feel it in our bones. We know this is not forever. And no matter how insulated we get from trouble in this life, uh, we have this understanding that not all is right. And that would be cause for despair if we didn't have hope in the coming of the kingdom of God. And Jesus taught us to pray this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that as it is above, so should it be below, that we invite the rightness and the right ordering and the priorities of God to infiltrate and fill our lives, not someday, not, not someday in heaven when we die, that, that that's where all things are made perfect. That is true, but we invite it here now. That in our city, in our nation, in our families, in our relationships, and the ones that we love, that the kingdom would come to us now. And so Jesus in Matthew chapter four, just a chapter before, he, he, he begins preaching. And it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we have to understand that these beatitudes are not just like these nice moral sayings, uh, you know, for coffee mugs. But this is the continuation of this message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That what he is about to do in, in giving these beatitudes, he's not just saying nice things to make your, your life a little better. He is saying this is just a description of what the kingdom of heaven looks like. 
And if you allow yourself to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you're going to find blessing. You're going to find happiness. You're going to find peace for your soul. Jesus, through these statements in the Sermon on the Mount, he's inviting us to abandon foundations that are destined to failure and to place our life and our hope and the anchor for our future upon something that is eternal, that will never fail. And so he launches into this. Um, the systems that Jesus was constantly challenging and questioning um, are the systems that really all societies are built on. And th those are economics, family, politics, and religion. Now, in that, you, you see those, those two, family and religion. Well, those don't seem bad, right? As a professional religious person and someone who loves my family, those don't seem too bad. But even those, if you find as you read through the, the teachings of Jesus, he points out again and again that those are not eternal. That I cannot worship my family because eventually... I will be taken from them. I, I, I can't put all my hope in a system of religion that I do this and then God does that for me, that kind of give and take and transactional um, um, you know, relationship with God uh, because religion in the end is a facade or a construct that allows for control of people but doesn't always actually reveal the presence of God in your life. So we need something better. And of course, economics, as we learned in the stock market over the last few months, it doesn't take much to turn everything on its head. Politics, they're pretty stable, but besides that, <laughs> it's shifting ground. It's moving. And the systems of the world have every interest in selling us on their stability, but we ought to know better that we are looking for a firmer foundation. And so Jesus begins to teach and he opens up with this line uh, to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed or happy are you poor for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Isn't it interesting that he addresses his most famous sermon first to the poor. Um, in Jesus' day, there are nine different layers of, of people in society. There's nine different rungs on society's ladder uh, and Greek words for each of those different rungs. At the top, on number one, you have the, the most rich and the most powerful. There's a Greek word for that. And then you get down to six, seven, layers down, and that's the peasant class. Those are the working people that, that don't own land. They, they, they work for a living. They, they till the land. They're agrarian. They're, they're poor, um, but they're laborers. And, and many times, especially in the parables and, and in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is among these kind of people, sixes and sevens. And he's, he's teaching them and, and using uh, parables and illustrations that would resonate with sixes and sevens. But there is a class much lower than sixes and sevens, eights and nines. And in Greek, uh, the phrase is literally the crouching ones. They are the untouchables. They are the cripples. They are the beggars. They are the ones that will never be anybody. They are the nobodies. And Jesus uses a level nine description of the poor for his most famous sermon. Level nines. These people are at the very, very bottom of society. They would have been seen as garbage. And Jesus makes it so clear as he begins into his beatitudes, just who the kingdom of heaven was designed for. It was designed for nines. It was designed for untouchables. It was designed for the people underneath the ladder in society. I'm sure that the, the people around him are thinking, man, life is tough. I mean, the, the Romans were taking two-thirds of their income in taxes. 
And then they would go to the temple and then the, 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 the religious leaders would take another large percent of that for temple fees so that they could, they could hopefully convince God out of all their troubles that they have because they lost most of their income to the government and on and on it goes. These are beat down people. And so they come to Jesus, the teacher, and they're hoping maybe he has a pattern or a formula or a way that we can rise above this. And instead, Jesus says, right here where you are is where God meets you with his presence and his kingdom. And you, level nines, in the gutter of society, are first in line for what God's going to do. Because if there is one way to summarize what Jesus is talking about when he he talks about the kingdom of heaven, it's a rearrangement of what's important. St. Francis of Assisi um, Embrace poverty at an extreme level as part of his mission and his ministry. And uh, he was so compelled uh, to embrace poverty. He grew up as a son of a wealthy merchant and um, as an adult, he entered into to ministry and he renounced all of his material possessions. Uh, but it wasn't enough for him to be poor. He embraced a level of poverty uh, that was outrageous. Um, to where cooked food would be provided, he'd turn it down to eat raw food sprinkled with ashes so that it wouldn't taste too good for him. Um, He would purposefully uh, alter his clothes to make them less attractive. Some of you might be thinking, Evan, do you do that as well? (laughs) No. He would go after this level of poverty that even the poor among him or uh, in his community in Assisi, they didn't have that kind of poverty. And I think you have to try really hard to maintain that level of poverty that St. Francis maintained. And what I'm not saying when we look at these passages is that the, the way to be happy is to seek out poverty, to seek out persecution, to seek out insults. We're going to talk about this next week. To try to be more hungry and thirsty. I'm not sure that that's what he's asking. And and, um, a commentary by Stanley Hauerwas, he said this, and I thought it was beautiful. Too often, these characteristics of the blessings in Christian history have been turned into ideals or virtues that we must strive to attain. When we do that, we turn them into formulas that help us gain status and favor with God, which of course is precisely the opposite of what he's trying to say. Rather, they are descriptions of the kinds of people to whom Jesus in fact first brought the kingdom of God. Nowhere does Jesus tell us that we should try to be poor in spirit or mourning all the time or try to get yourself persecuted. He simply announces the great surprise that these people who are not significant or honored in their society are precisely the ones who have received the honor to be first among those let into God's kingdom. What I'm trying and and hopefully doing today is painting a picture that what God values and what society values are not the same things. And that should change how we interact with society around us, especially when it comes to the least of those among us. When we begin to understand that the priority that the kingdom of God places on the most broken and the most poor and the most desperate in society, it will change how we respond as a people. And then we get to what the focus is this week, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Um, I, I pride myself on being mostly self-sufficient most of the time. Anybody with me? I mean, self-sufficiency is, is really a status symbol. I don't, I don't need anything from anybody that I can't create myself. Unfortunately, for many of us, it's also an idol that We don't need to ask for help. We don't need exterior support. We've got this. And that is something that will keep us from the presence of God and his kingdom. Because to understand that we're hungry is to admit that we lack, is to admit that there is an emptiness in us that we need God to fill. There is wrongness that needs to be made right. There is injustice that needs to be made right just. 
And if you're hungry and thirsty, do you have what you need or do you lack it? You lack it. And so we hunger for righteousness because we see a world that lacks righteousness. We, we need justice for those who have not been able to get justice, who are facing injustice. Just like the poor, the mourning, and the meek, there are also people that are in those categories and also cannot receive justice. And that's not me. I can afford justice. I'm a, I'm a home-owning, passport-carrying citizen of the U.S. of A, baby. Don't mess with me. If you assault me in the parking lot, which I hope my preaching is better than that, but if you assault me in the parking lot, I have access to justice for that. But it is not so for everybody. And it is easy for me to insulate myself from the plight of people who don't have justice who are poor, who are hungry. I can live my whole life and not have to think about it. What a gift that is. But God invites us to think about it. God invites us to attach ourselves to the eights and the nines of the world because just maybe the view of the kingdom of God is better from level nine than it is from level one. And as we become the people who are constantly aware of the pain around us, that seems like a pretty grim job that we take on. But Jesus promises that for those who allow themselves to hunger and thirst for rightness, righteousness, justice in their world, there's blessing and happiness. How is this possible? I think it's possible because no matter what, you're going to hunger for something. You know that? You're going to hunger for something. And whether that's, that's security and, and financial prosperity or a, a new car or a more interesting husband, <laughs> you're going to hunger for something. And Jesus invites us in the Sermon on the Mount for those of us who are ones and twos and threes up on the ladder who don't automatically get first in line to the kingdom of heaven, that if we're up on that ladder, we ought to. We ought to trade in our hunger for the things that we would naturally hunger for in society. We ought to trade that in for a hunger for righteousness and justice in the world around us. And we ought to let that hunger drive us to put ourselves in proximity with people who are hurting. I came here yesterday to the church. I was um, just finishing up some of my study and um, there was young adults in the parking lot and Pastor Ben came in to my office after they're wrapping up, and I, I didn't know what was going on. He said, yeah, we just got, uh, we bought some used bike carriers behind the bikes, and we're just loading them up with supplies and, and different things, and we're going to drive those bikes. Some of the young adults are just going to drive those bikes around some of the homeless camps in town and just encourage people. And I thought, well, that's beautiful. What a beautiful thing. You know, we don't, we don't always do it perfectly, but when we allow ourselves to interact and connect with people that are maybe a lower number on the socioeconomic ladder, there is a power in what God will do through our community. When we attach ourselves to the plight of the least of these, our lives and our community and our churches begin to look more like Jesus. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is easier to see from level nine. And this is what it does as we we connect ourselves to this hunger for rightness, God's righteousness, God's justice in the world. It replaces how can I get ahead for me and mine with this phrase that we've been talking about all year. What does love require? What does love require of us in this season? Home churches. Maybe you're watching with your home church today. Uh, What does love require in the neighborhood where you're meeting and gathering? What could we do? How can we show mercy? Little acts of mercy everywhere we go. How can we be a church that is known for mercy? My goodness. How can we love without motive? How can we give more than we've ever given? Financially, yes, but with our time and our care and our affection that we give and give and give. But what would happen if we had such a, such a approach to the community that God has placed us in that nothing would be too great to give? 
because the least of these have access to the kingdom of God. They are the ones that Jesus spoke to. And so Jesus, we invite you, Jesus, to work in our hearts and, and do the hard work in our souls uh, to where mercy becomes our default response to a hostile world around us. With people upset and angry and, and fighting every, er, everywhere we look, God, that mercy and righteousness, joy, and the Holy Spirit would be our theme. And that as you work that into our church and our communities and our home churches and our community groups, God, there would just be a sense of your grace and your presence moving throughout your church. God, we love you and we thank you that the kingdom is coming now. It's among us and we welcome it. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. This is not a stage. The lights of the show, the roar of the crowd, have no place in this grand auditorium. The theater is vast, but the audience is one. Lofty phrases echo throughout, but the applause is saved for the simple. It is here that we meet with God. He is your Father. He knows you. He responds, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. As above, so below. us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>